Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to another Free Market Foundation podcast. This week, a very special episode. I'm hosting Alexander Hammond today from the IEA in the UK. Uh, Alex, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, Chris. You know, I'm a big fan of Free Market Foundation. So thank you very much for having me on. I'm looking forward to it. Always a pleasure to, to talk to you. Uh, Alex, I thought we'd start this week by just giving the viewers a bit of an overview of things happening in the UK. Uh, where, where you're based, just to your view on the coronavirus, maybe some of the government regulations, uh, just your take on how things are at the moment. I know that the UK, I think it has now overtaken Italy. Uh, the US, I think, is leading in terms of number of infections. But the UK, it seems like things are going quite badly. So if you could just give us uh, your, your take on, on how things have been going in the last few weeks. Yes, yeah, so it's been quite bad recently. The, the number of cases every day continues to go up. Um, we're not quite at Italy's level, um, especially in regards to deaths and mm -hmm. everything. It seems are about uh, 10 days, two weeks behind or so. Um, but yeah, things are getting quite serious. And uh, Boris Johnson, our prime minister, also has it. And last right, night, yeah, that was announced last, what's today? Today's the 7th of April. So on the, yeah. the 6th, the, on the evening of the 6th, the prime minister was admitted. Very, very sad news. Yeah, and he's now in intensive care, mm. um, and that's really worrying. Hopefully, it's all just kind of precautionary, and just in case he goes downhill, he's got right. the medical staff there. Um, but yeah, it's hit a lot of high members of our, our government. Our health secretary's also had it, and uh, potentially Michael Gove also has it. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got symptoms, and hasn't been tested. So yeah, uh, some of the me measures that are put in place, we're not allowed to leave our house unless it's for medicines essential supplies like food okay. um, if you're an essential worker and you're allowed one uh, daily exercise a day you're allowed to is, is that the amount of day. exercise specified or not um it doesn't say duration okay um, so theoretically who knows you could go for a 10-hour walk but yeah <laughs> i don't think that's recommended uh, by anyone and it should be short and right. just to keep you healthy okay fair enough at least there's a little bit of leeway. I mean, for us in South Africa, it's only you can go out to the pharmacy and, and to do some, some shopping to buy some food. But again, it's only for essential things. Restaurants are closed, takeaways, all that sort of thing. And of course, you can't even take your dog for a walk. Our minister of police, he is, uh, he's, it seems like he's really taken to the situation to exercise some of his more um, authoritarian tendencies to uh, push push very strongly against anyone wanting to go outside for any particular reason he made it clear to use that example of you can't walk your dog even so i suppose in governments around the world we're seeing some bureaucrats and politicians taking advantage of the clampdown more than others yeah and i think that was quite a nice thing to see in the uk actually it seemed boris johnson was very reluctant to put in these measures mm -hmm. um and he's very unhappy with it and which is, I think, is a good thing. It's um, of course civil liberties. He's taking it um, with enormous consideration. So. No, that is that is good to see. Whenever anyone in, in government with that sort of power, I guess, is a bit hesitant about imposing more power, you should sort of be, you know, you should you should be grateful for that. Those kinds of people are in power. The people who are uncomfortable about using power uh, to infringe on civil liberties, I think should, should make us relatively happy. I realize it's not an ideal situation, but it's better than the alternative, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, what do you think going forward, uh, the, the, the British uh, government might do? Is there anything in particular that stands out? Uh, do you think they will start rolling back some of the regulations? Do you think it's too soon to say, of course, we're not going to make any particular medical predictions or, or give anything like medical advice. But, you know, if you just sort of want to, I guess, put yourself in that position and project a little bit. Yeah. So I think a potential next step, if cases do increase drastically, they might remove that uh, bit of exercise per day. Okay. They might have uh, restrictions more similar to what's going on in South Africa. Um, and that's almost been hinted at if people take too much advantage of it, it could be done, but, it seems once the health secretary hinted at that the other day, he then uh, kind of retreated and said, oh, okay, we're not going to get rid of that. So potentially that's one option that could go. Um, I still see as several weeks before even slight measures will be relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like we're in this for a good month or two, but who knows how long it could go on for. I think an important point to highlight in all this, you know, regardless of how things play out in the long run in the UK or in South Africa or indeed any other country in, around the world, is just the amount of pressure that it is that is on governments and public healthcare sectors. 
and the pressure that governments take upon themselves. We know, of course, in the UK how sacred the NHS is and no one would really want to touch it and talk about sort of um, lessening it or, or downsizing it. So that might be unrealistic, but just um, I think it's an important point to keep in mind how if governments weren't so responsible for everyone's health care, there wouldn't be this much pressure on them to flatten the curve, that concept that we've all heard and talked about so much. There would be much more scope for the private sector to fulfill all the needs of people who, who get coronavirus. Yeah, and it's a really interesting one for classical liberals, the extent to which government should intervene in this situation. Um, for example, John Mill's the harm principle, mm -hmm. John Stuart Mill's harm principle, we tend to think it's the risk of a situation is on the individual. Um, and if it causes harm to other, that's then when the state intervenes. Mm -hmm. But in a situation like a big global health pandemic, when the risk is hard to be on the individual because you might not know if you have it sure. um, and you don't know if you spread it, it could be potentially deadly. So the harm principle is a difficult one to measure the extent of government intervention during times like this. But I think maybe if we take a step back and look more broadly, at, um, for example, John Locke's uh, mm -hmm. the idea that government should protect life, liberty and property, um, or a state, he, he says, I believe. Um, so it is the government role to protect life in situations like these. Um, and it's just as much their right to intervene as much as it would be to imprison a murderer um, or protect the state against invasion. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a role, but we just have to be very careful about the extent in which they intervene. And once the measures, or once uh, Corona has kind of settled down or there's fewer cases when these civil liberties can come back. And even in some cases, the classical liberal economics can actually act as quite a good guide uh, for governments on how to control the economy in situations like this. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that in a lot of deregulation happening across the world. At the moment. I, I'd really like to pick up on that last point of yours, um, deregulation. We, we as classical liberals, I mean, you know, we, we love to maybe too much uh, rail on about government regulations, that sort of thing. That's part of our job in, in any case at work. In, in working in the sort of at the think tanks that we do, we, we want to point out what regulations are impacting on people's lives, especially on poor people in, in our respective countries. But just there, um, maybe in the UK or other examples in other countries that you can think of where regulations are being rolled back and where you think it could hopefully serve society better in the long run? Yeah, sure. So there's um, in the UK, for example, there's been a lot of uh, on workers returning back into the NHS before if you retired and came back to the NHS you could only work 16 hours a week uh, that's been removed there's been all sorts of measures on truck drivers mm -hmm. um, rather than if they're transporting foods or medicines rather than having to have a break or they can only work up to nine hours they can now work up to 11 hours um, and their rest has also been decreased um, in the United States we're seeing the some states where you couldn't be a doctor and practice across borders across state uh, boundaries mm -hmm. because uh, for some reason if you're practice in michigan you might not be able to practice in another state then they're beginning to what they get up to in michigan so <laughs> <laughs> who knows um and and in uh, germany we're seeing uh, sunday trading laws being abolished so supermarkets can stay open longer um and it's always just tiny little regulations happening across the world um in the uk and in some states in america Restaurants can, can now do takeaways without having to apply for a separate permit, which was previously needed. Um, and yeah, we're seeing that everywhere. In South Africa, we have, I, th I think it should be said to the government's credit, you know, we have seen the rolling back of some restrictions and regulations on the informal sector, which is huge in South Africa uh, for a lot of people there. I mean, they have to share a, a very small little home, if you can even call it a home with perhaps up to 10 other people, their shop is right around the corner that they have to walk to every day uh, for them to sell produce and that sort of thing on the streets, uh, you know, for street vendors on the street corners. That's how they make a living day to day. So in that regard, there has been some rollback on, on regulations and restrictions on how they trade. The same with minibus uh, taxis, which a lot, probably the majority of South Africans rely on for transport. Um, those have also now, the regulations on them have been uh, scaled back a bit to allow them to transport more people as long as they, for example, you know, make sure they give their passengers uh, masks and they provide hand sanitizer and that sort of thing, which I think makes sense. Um, and then the government can indeed help with that sort of thing. They can hand out 
these sorts of um, helpful tools, these preventative measures to those who can't afford them. I think there we can very much say government has a role to play for those who really can't afford these sorts of things. Focus on them, focus on rolling out support uh, in those sectors. Let the private sector, let, let the more affluent classes do their thing. For some of us, you know, we're very lucky that we have homes, we have nice TVs, we have Wi-Fi, we have gardens, that sort of thing. So this lockdown is, is nice on us than it is on, on many South Africans. Yeah, and with these mass deregulations we're seeing, it kind of makes us ponder what what was their use in the first place. Right. Um, if they're suddenly being deregulated now in a time of huge crisis, why are they there in the first place? Mm -hmm. Not to limit and impede trade between uh, businesses and individuals. Um, but it's also quite interesting because we see deregulation happening on one side, but then on the other side of the coin, we see governments getting very involved in the economy in the form of uh, stimulus packages yes. and giving huge handouts. Um, loads of countries are looking to add stimulus packages and potentially paying employees wages. Um, here in the UK, the government's laid out a strategy where they can pay up to 80% of an employee's wage if they're fellowed. Um, mm -hmm. So they, if, the go if a company can't afford to keep them, the government's willing to pay a certain percentage of their salary. Right. Um, and similarly in America, they've added a stimulus package, package of $2 trillion. Um, <laughs> with, uh, I know, enormous. Um, with enormous $500 billion going to corporations. I mean, another 250 billion going to give everyone who's on a salary of less than $70,000, which is the vast majority of Americans, um, a check for $1,200, just a one-off payment. And that's really, it's interesting one for classical liberals, because on the one hand, we think, no, government doesn't have a role in just giving out money to individuals. Mm -hmm. But there's an interesting piece from uh, the Cater Institute um, and a guy called Andy, Andy Craig, mm -hmm. And he basically, he agrees that the government should be giving out some sort of money like this mm -hmm. on the basis, uh, I've got the quote saying, it's not feasible for the government to abruptly order massive shutdowns of so much of the economy without some sort of compensation. And it's pretty much exactly the same as we'd expect compensation for eminent domain. Right. If the government enforces a shutdown of the economy, we should get con some compensation back. Mm -hmm. But it's tough because in normal times, that would be completely a no-no. <laughs> the classical liberals, whereas now it's um, potentially, it, it can make sense to be coherent with the ideology. Of course, it is a bit of a, a sticky topic, but you can also make the argument that, I mean, as, as people are taxed, they should surely get some of that tax money back in, in some way. So it could be stated as simply as that. Of course, we, I think, you know, I speak on your behalf, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't want to see government assistance for any particular corporation in, in an ideal situation if they have failed due to their own actions that, you know, they should fail on those terms. No, they shouldn't receive bailouts and things like that. That's one of the biggest problems in South Africa is the state owned mm -hmm. enterprises keep getting government funded bailouts uh, year after year, no matter how badly they perform. But, you know, perhaps you could make that argument in this context, in this situation, um, governments giving some sort of defined aid, you know, it's not, it's not left open ended forever kind of thing. Um, yeah. This has now been, been restricted to this sort of these definitions that you mentioned. And I think instead of perhaps giving the handouts, it would make more sense and actually, if the taxes were lowered in the first place, for example, of if course. the tax was lowered in the first place, you, you then wouldn't have to either give out the money or, and go through the huge administrative burden of finding out how much each American is on and shipping the check to the house or however they're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it would save a lot of money in both senses and also help the economy post-crisis. Um, it will ensure people have more money to spend in the long term as opposed to trying to do things like lower interest rates or just give out uh, one-off payments. Mm -hmm. We mentioned on our, on our Free Marketeers podcast last week just some of the, the things that the South African government can do post-epidemic. Uh, and one of the things was, I think, countries that, that do these sorts of things like lowering taxes uh, amongst the range of issues and policies, if they do that sort of thing, they're going to emerge very strongly in the post-COVID-19 world. Yeah, and what's worrying about COVID-19 happening at the moment is it gives a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion, especially from our friends on the left, mm -hmm. um, potentially this being proof that we should instill more isolationist policies um, and kind of become more self-sufficient. Yes. And the crisis is kind of making it seem like that could be a, a good idea. Um, the idea, if you say to someone, yeah, we should grow our own food so we're self-sufficient, we don't rely on anyone else. 
it sounds plausible in practice sure but in reality it is quite literally nonsense mm -hmm. um if you try to produce everything you yourself you're completely vulnerable to local shocks like a bad harvest or a blight or whatever else um but the chances of a bad harvest happening across the world mm -hmm. um, are very remote and national self-sufficiency on anything whether it be food or manufacturing or services to me makes as much about as much as sense as a village self-sufficiency or household self-sufficiency um, it's basic uh, ricardian economics whereby you have comparative advantage different people do different uh, jobs better and that's what helps your economy grow over a long period of time mm -hmm. Um, and building on that is if countries do turn inwards and become more nationalist, when this crisis begins to be over and some countries are beginning to recover, so we don't know who it will be first, maybe it's South Korea, maybe it's Japan, right. um, and they still have their services, their manufacture, their agriculture businesses up full going, um, potentially could provide us with tons of services. If we're still being affected by the crisis and we turn our back on that, that would be hugely damaging. Um, so I think that's something we should watch out for. National self-sufficiency doesn't work and it does not increase economic productivity. Um, and I think one thing we sh should remember from recent history is after fi the financial crash in 2008, 2009, a lot of the countries put in policies um, that would limit the amount of food that they could export. And um, the idea behind this was that they would help secure local supplies. But in reality, it caused a huge food uh, crisis. Um, and later analysis showed that the isolationist policies accounted for 40% of the increase in the global price of wheat um, by 2011, which is enormous. And that's especially harmful for the poorest people who, mm -hmm. most, who more of their salary makes up for food uh, spending rather than mm. from the rich. So... Yeah, that's a big worry. I think always with uh, government policies, what whatever they're aimed at achieving or what whatever they're aimed towards, you should probably in ninety nine percent of of cases expect that they will achieve the opposite. So these sorts of policies would, you know, they say it's for food security, it's to boost local produce and manufacturing, like you say, but at the end of the day, it has the opposite effect. So governments need to be very careful in how they intervene in the economy. Um, there's also a false perception going around that governments need to manage the economy. I don't think that's that's the right formulation of a government's role at all, unfortunately. Um, I think going forward, we, those of us at least in the classical liberal um, sphere, we should very, very strongly emphasize the importance of global trade and trade between countries because there's a very real risk, as you say, that countries are going to become more self-isolating. And on that point, you've written a lot on, on trade and specifically trade for, for Africa and in Africa. Um, do you think this epidemic, what sort of impact or not will it have on the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement? Do you think it's going to scupper any of those talks? Do you think there's enough already in place that they're going to go ahead with it? Um, what do you think is going to, go, going to happen going forward? Yeah, so... More broadly, I'm very worried that uh, COVID-19 will kind of spur arguments for nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, nationalist economic policies in countries like the UK, the USA, some countries in Europe. But I'm far more concerned for the nations that are only just becoming more globalized and just uh, implementing policies of free trade. And mm -hmm. like you mentioned, the African continental free trade area is a great example of that. Um, it's meant to be implemented in July. And upon its introduction, within five years, it will cut 90% of tariffs on goods traded between nation states. That would be incredible. Um, yeah, it would be great news for Africa and a huge economic boost. Um, I think the UN still predicts it, if every member was to sign up, it could increase into regional trade by 52% Jeez. in just a few years. Um, and it is meant to go into place in, on July the 1st. And currently 30 members have, oh no, sorry, I think it's 29 members have ratified, mm -hmm. um, ratified the agreement with 54 signing on. But I do think, I don't know for certain, but I do think it's likely the trade agreement would be delayed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a huge worry because it being delayed combined with a lot of countries potentially not being convinced that free trade is a way to go post-crisis, that is a deadly combination. Um, so we need I think it might be delayed, but I really hope it doesn't because mm -hmm. the benefits it could bring to Africa um, and especially the poorest countries within Africa is immense. 
when this when they first started talking about the the sort of agreement in its embryonic stage i think a lot of us were very excited we we thought okay now africa is really going to go along the right path for centuries africa has been hobbled by the wrong policies uh, the wrong you know uh, actions by governments whether they were um, imperial powers or their own uh, their own governments own african governments and now there was a chance for something truly radical uh, mm -hmm. truly radical economic freedom and growth which would be incredible for Africa. The, a lot of people have talked about this century being the century of Africa. That can only happen if Africa has the right policies, the policies that empower um, Africans sort of on the ground to take care of their own well-being and to grow their own wealth, um, their own wealth pies as such. You know, to think of Africa having one wealth pie that needs to be redistributed for me is the wrong kind of thinking. We need to think of each person creating wealth for themselves instead of governments always redistributing wealth. Um, so. I, I think I take what you're saying that it will probably delay the implementation. I really hope it doesn't put it completely off the table mm -hmm. that at least we get back to it at some point. Of course, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, he is also the chair of the African Union. So I'm really hoping that from his side, he spearheads the sort of thing. He has every now and then talked about reform in Africa in South Africa. We haven't seen the right kinds of reforms. That's also partly why we got the recent uh, credit downgrade to junk status from Moody's. It's because they cited that there simply isn't reason for them to believe that we're going to get the reforms we need in the near future. But yeah, let's hope they keep the, the Africa Free Trade Agreement at least on the table and keep discussing it. Maybe if it's just on the back burner, but that that's still in their minds in some way or not. Uh, Alex, just one more thing I wanted to touch on with you. Uh, what do you think this will this coronavirus will do for you know for countries going forward in terms of you know their trade with each other there's a lot of trade between south africa and the uk um, that i think is very important i think many south africans underestimate the importance of our trade with the rest of the world that we need goods to come in our manufacturing isn't as strong as it as it used to be um, that sort of thinking i think is prevalent that as you touched on earlier that we can just produce everything on our own um, but do you do you think it's all doom and gloom or do you think there might be gaps or sort of rays of hope here and there if we sort of elucidate to people that the rights, you know, if, if done in the right ways, if trade is really pursued uh, with vigor, it can help uh, economies like South Africa's? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one because it, we kind of see as a whole across the world, uh, globalism, as it were, is in a bit of, a crisis but mm -hmm. i think globalism i've mentioned to you before it's a bit of a weird term mm. because i feel it almost has two definitions there's one definition for globalism is big supranational organizations like the eu like the un these big world government bodies um but then there's the other form of globalism which we're in favor of which is more globalization more free trade um and i feel they have been uh, just been mistaken quite a lot over mm -hmm. time especially from our friends on the left um, globalism and even you can actually I've met many classical liberals who are against globalism but their definition of globalism it being the big supernatural national organization yes. um, and I think what coronavirus has shown is to organizations like the European Union it's been very harmful um, because what happened when coronavirus hit the EU is the first bit of trouble, all the nations instantly turned inwards to protect their own national interests. Um, when Italy had it quite bad, but it hadn't quite spread to the rest of Europe, Germany refused to send masks because they felt they could later need it, um, rather than there being, being a coordinated strategy from the EU all uh, individual member states kind of took unilateral measures to shut their borders at different times um, and really take it upon themselves. And I think this is really interesting because the, through the five years or so I've been studying and writing about Brexit as a whole, one of the best arguments I heard against Brexit is from a foreign policy perspective, where when once in a blue moon events happen, um, whether it be a pandemic or a war, it would be better for groups of countries to be grouped together to get through the big crisis, whatever it may be. Um, however, we've kind of seen from the coronavirus is just the slight, slightest bit of pressure, even initially, countries just retreat inwards and protect their self-interest. It was almost overnight, yeah, it's crazy. Which is absolutely fine to protect your own 
interest. It's, na it's a natural response, mm -hmm. but it shows the inability of the EU as a whole um, to unite the countries in the times of crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I felt, one of the best arguments against Brexit was when a big, huge, bad event happens, being united is better than being alone. But mm -hmm. it turns out it doesn't matter regardless. Um, so that's, I think, the future of globalism um, in, regard, in the EU sense. And I think the World Health Organization is also having quite a bad time yeah. about it. <laughs> yep, they didn't handle things very well. Yeah, I feel they've been completely unprepared for this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've spent the years after SARS and Ebola talking too much about tobacco and sugary drinks right. um, and obesity rather than actually trying to prepare for an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Whereas we've seen private organizations like the Gates Foundation being really prepared and actually set up a coalition um, of uh, preparedness of innovation for mm. the academic to hear. Whereas the WTO's not really done that. And mm -hmm. in the early days, even in January, the middle of January, the WTO tweeted that the investigations conducted in China have shown no clear evidence of human to human transmission of the virus. Of mm -hmm. the virus. Mm -hmm. And we know that not to be true. We knew China knew it was um, transmitted between humans long before that. Right. Um, and the Taiwanese even warned against that. So I feel they've been really slow to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and I know many places have stopped using WTO numbers because they simply can't trust them, and especially the numbers from China. Mm -hmm. I think the, the World Health Organization, they have been really pushed in a certain direction by, I think, you know, the biggest player in this, this whole epidemic, which was China. I mean, there again is a very strong argument, I think, for government transparency and less, and, and less government control because, I mean, China the government there, if it was honest with its people and with the rest of the world, I think the rest of the world would have been better prepared for the epidemic. Um, they wouldn't, they also, I don't, not that it justifies it, but we would have seen less of a backlash against Chinese people in general, because I think there are elements of that worryingly um, popping up that see, people seem to conflate, you know, the actions of individual Chinese people with the Chinese government's restricting information, that sort of thing, which I don't think we should ever conflate those two things. Um, the, the actions of individuals is much different from the actions of a government. Exactly, yes. The individual is the smallest minority. There we go. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, you want to say? Yeah, I was just going to say that it has been the WTO's response has been quite strange in how China centric it's been. Mm -hmm. I know a few days ago, the World Health Organization uh, assistant director general said that if he had COVID 19, he wanted to be treated in China, which I just, <laughs> it's, it's a very weird thing to say, really. Well, um, maybe he's just a multicultural man. Well, maybe perhaps. Um, but then also in late March, we had this uh, journalist ask about Taiwan's success mm -hmm. um, in dealing with uh, the coronavirus. And at first, the Assistant Director General ignored the question. Um, when she offered to repeat it on a, web, a webcam, um, he strangely said no. And then seconds later, she was mysteriously cut off from the call. Mm -hmm. um, and when she called back again to ask about Taiwan and their response, um, he didn't mention Taiwan once in his answer and then he talked about China. Um, that obviously shows that politics is coming into our response of a response from the WTO in dealing with this pandem pandemic. Yep. And that's what we don't want from a world organization that's meant to protect us in times of crisis, not to play politics with individual nation states. I think uh, Jeffrey Tucker and the uh, the AIER, they've been writing probably three or four articles a day, but a lot of them have focused on this this aspect of politics and science being um, being sort of mixed with each other and just how partisan a lot of things have become um, and how worrying that is that in the early days of the pandemic, especially in the US, just how how people jumped on, on for example, the Trump presidency, not you know, not doing enough, but now that he, he's worried, not now that he's worried about not, you know, being too authoritarian, our friends on the left want him to be more authoritarian. So you, you sort of, you don't know where to go. Should, should governments really take this iron world approach? Should they not? I just think the most important thing is transparency and open exchange of information. Where that has happened, we're seeing scientists all around the world with funding from people like Bill Gates. They're trying to get vaccines for this, uh, not just one vaccine, but multiple vaccines for multiple strands of this coronavirus. Yeah, and lying about data or manipulating it in any way, it's very dangerous because mm -hmm. that could mean scientists, I, I am not a scientist, I don't know the science behind this, mm -hmm. but that could mean scientists could come to wrong conclusions um, in whether they're tracking 
where it's going, the epidemiology of it, um, or coming up with the treatment. So reliable data and, as you said, transparent government is what's needed here. Yeah, Alex, I think uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, I'll give you the final word. Any parting thoughts? Please also uh, let our viewers know where they can find your work, where they can follow you. Yeah, so my parting thoughts is we as classical liberals should really try and be as strong as we can during these times um, in pushing the free trade message because the worry is when this is all over, um, the mercantilist argument will be come back stronger than ever. Um, and we need to be in a position to try and stop that in order to ensure free global trade. Um, and as we've seen in the last 40, 50 years of history, that's been the thing that has lifted billions of people out of poverty, um, cut extreme poverty rates and provided us cheap goods across the world. Um, and if you'd like to see more of my work or follow me on social media, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Alexander Hamo. Um, and on my Facebook, just Alexander Hammond. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. Viewers, thank you once again for joining us on the special episode. Please remember to like this video. Please uh, share it on your various social media platforms. Please keep an eye out for more uh, podcasts coming up. And please also share all of our work on our website, www.freemarketfoundation.com. Take care, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thank you.